All right, guys, welcome back. Let's start this lecture with a matching exercise. Here, I want you to match the sleep stage with, with its corresponding EEG waveform. So hit the pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back and we will talk about the important information we need to know about the sleep stages. All right, so here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, go ahead and hit the pause button. You'll probably notice that there were six options with five options on the right. So one thing uh, would have uh, two answers. So hopefully you got that right. Let's take a look now at the sleep physiology and the different stages of the sleep cycle that are commonly tested and of course very high yield. Now before we get into the sleep stages, don't forget that our circadian rhythm is driven by the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus which itself is actually regulated by certain environmental factors. The most important one, of course, is light. Now, the circadian rhythm is needed for the nighttime release of a variety of hormones like prolactin, ACTH, melatonin, and norepinephrine. When the SCN is stimulated, it causes the release of norepinephrine. That tells the pineal gland or the pineal gland, however you want to, you want to pronounce that one, to release melatonin. That melatonin thus induces sleepiness. And don't forget that the sleep cycle is broken into two stages. We have the non-REM sleep and the REM sleep. Now, certain substances are notorious for disrupting REM sleep. We have alcohol, barbiturates, as well as benzodiazepines. Okay. Now, don't forget that these substances also disrupt the non-REM sleep, specifically stage N3. Now, norepinephrine is also going to decrease the amount of REM sleep someone gets, so that's really important to keep in mind as well. So let's look at the stages of sleep now and then what we need to know about each stage. So start starting first with the first stage. Here you're just awake with your eyes open. So if you just stop, look forward, that would be the first stage. So it's not really a stage of sleep. You're awake, your eyes are open. This is when you're heading to bed, but you're still up. Now this is characterized by the presence of beta waves, which is the waveform with the lowest amplitude, but highest frequency. Now REM sleep is also characterized by the beta waves, which was on this, this question. Now the next stage is when you're awake, but your eyes are closed. What is this characterized by? Alpha waves. Then we go into our non-REM sleep. We have stages N1, N2, and N3. The first stage, N1, is where you'll spend around 5% of your sleep. This is light sleep, and this is characterized by the presence of theta waves. The next stage, N2, is where you'll spend the majority of your time, about 45% in fact, and this is a deeper stage than N1, but it's not quite as deep as N3. Now this stage is characterized by sleep spindles and K-complexes. Then we have N3. This is our deepest non-REM stage, and you're gonna spend about 25% of your time in this stage. Now this is where pathologies like sleepwalking, uh, night terrors, and bedwetting can occur. Now benzodiazepines are an effective aid in preventing sleepwalking and night terrors, and it works by decreasing the length of time spent in N3. Remember earlier I mentioned how um, alcohol, barbs, and benzos can disrupt N3. Well, in this instance, we can take advantage of that adverse effect to decrease uh, someone's sleep pathologies. Now, this stage is characterized by delta waves. These demonstrate the highest amplitude, but the lowest frequency. And the last stage is REM sleep. This is where you'll spend about 25% of your time. Now, this happens approximately every 90 minutes, and the duration increases as you progress through the night. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is also characterized by the presence of beta waves, just as which stage? That would be the awake stage with your eyes wide open. Now, do you know which neurological condition is associated with a decrease in REM latency? That would be narcolepsy. Now, in REM sleep, we've got a lot going on. That's why you're going to lose muscle tone during this stage of sleep. Now, this is a stage where you'll see changes in heart rate, blood pressure, uh, acetylcholine release, which of course increases. Um, don't forget that REM sleep is where penile tumescence, dreaming, and nightmares also occur. Now it's also important to remember that in people with depression, the amount of time spent in REM sleep actually increases, but there's a decreased REM latency. Now the amount of time spent in the N3 stage is going to decrease, and of course one of the key features of major depression is repeated nighttime awakening and early morning awakening. Now, one last thing to remember about the REM sleep stage is that in the elderly, there's a decrease in the amount of time spent in both REM and N3 sleep, and there's an increased sleep latency 
and an increase in early morning awakening. All right, make sure you know those, it's always tested. Now, we're gonna look at the hypothalamus next. I'm gonna take you th to, through three multiple choice questions. I'm not gonna talk about the correct answer after every one. I'm gonna take you through three questions, and then at the end, we'll talk about the hypothalamus. So here's your first question. Go ahead and hit the pause button, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer, and I will give you the correct answer. Correct answer to this question is C, ventromedial nucleus. All right, next question, hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer is A, suprachiasmatic nucleus. All right, here is your last question. Hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer, and we'll discuss everything we need to know based on these last three questions. The correct answer here is D, paraventricular nucleus. Let's talk about the hypothalamus, an extremely important regulator of the body. So the hypothalamus is, of course, going to help us maintain homeostasis. It does this by regulating body temperature, thirst, water balance, controls the pituitary, regulates hunger, uh, the autonomic nervous system, sexual urges. And you can actually remember all of those with the mnemonic TAN hats. Let's take a look at the different components of the hypothalamus. Now, First up, we have the lateral nucleus. This regulates hunger. So what happens if we have an injury or pathology to the lateral nucleus? Well, it's our hunger center, right? Regulates hunger. So it will lead to anorexia because there will simply be no drive to eat. Now this structure is regulated by a specific hormone made in the GI tract, which stimulates hunger. Do you know which hung what, what its name is? It is ghrelin. Now one more question about ghrelin. Which type of cells of the GI tract produce ghrelin? That would be the enteroendocrine cells. Next up, the ventromedial nucleus. This regulates satiety. So just like the lateral nucleus, nucleus when it was damaged caused anorexia, if our satiety-inducing structure is damaged, what do we get? Hyperphagia. You'll never feel satisfied and will therefore want to just keep eating and eating and eating. Then we have the anterior and the posterior nucleus. The anterior nucleus is parasympathetic and it will help with cooling the body. The posterior nucleus is sympathetic and it helps with heating the body. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is needed to maintain the circadian rhythm. The supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei, which if you've watched endocrine already, you should remember are needed to synthesize ADH and oxytocin. Um, do you remember which does which? The supraoptic nucleus is responsible for ADH, the paraventricular nucleus for oxytocin. And finally, we have the preoptic nucleus. This is needed for thermoregulation and sexual behavior. This nucleus also releases GnRH, which would be necessary to stimulate the release of LH and FSH from the pituitary. And don't forget that if GnRH-producing neurons don't migrate from the developing nose, we get a syndrome known as Kalman syndrome. Now, this condition is characterized by absent or delayed puberty and an impaired sense of smell. All right, next up we've got the thalamus, and we'll do the exact same thing here. I'm going to give you a few multiple choice questions. We'll discuss everything at the end. All right, here is your first question. Hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you got the right answer. I will let you know the correct answer. Correct answer here is D, the medial geniculate nucleus. All right, next question. Hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you got the right answer. Correct answer here is A, the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Last question, hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's go over the different nuclei associated with the thalamus, their input, the senses they're responsible for, and their destinations. So first, don't forget that the thalamus is the major relay center for all ascending sensory information except for one. Do you know what that is? Olfaction. So first up, we've got the ventral posterior lateral nucleus, and the input here is the spinothalamic and dorsal columns and medial lemniscus. This is going to be responsible for vibration, for pain, pressure, conscious proprioception, light touch, and temperature. 
Its destination is the primary somatosensory cortex, which is in the parietal lobe. Then we have the ventral posterior medial nucleus, whose input is the trigeminal and gustatory pathways, and who senses taste and facial sensations. Now the destination is the primary somatosensory cortex. Then we've got the lateral geniculate nucleus, whose input is cranial nerve two, the optic chiasm, and then of course the optic tract. Now the destination here is the primary visual cortex. That is in which lobe? That is in the occipital lobe. Next is the medial geniculate nucleus, whose input is the superior olive and the inferior colliculus of the tectum. This is responsible for hearing, and its destination is, of course, the primary auditory cortex. Which lobe is that found in? That's the temporal lobe. And finally, we have the ventral anterior and lateral nuclei, whose inputs are the basal ganglia and cerebellum, and who are responsible for mortar control. Their destination is the mortar cortices of the frontal lobe. All right, next up, we have a matching exercise. So go ahead and hit the pause button, figure these out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All right, if you need to fix anything, hit the pause button. Otherwise, let's take a look at the dopaminergic pathways, paying specific attention to the effects of either increased or decreased activity of each. First, we have the mesocortical, which when activity decreases will lead to the presence of negative symptoms. Remember, negative symptoms can be thought of as though something is missing or has been taken away. Usually a patient is apathetic or they have a flattened affect. Next is the mesolimbic pathway, this is associated with positive symptoms when activity is increased. Remember, these types, of, these types of symptoms are the ones most often concerning and they're the target for most antipsychotic medications. These are things that are added, right? So um, negative symptoms are things are taken away, positive are things added. The negrostriatal pathway, um, when activity here is decreased, is associated with extra pyramidal symptoms like dystonia, Parkinsonism, tardive dyskinesia, and akesthesia. Now, when you see someone with movement disorders, I want you to think of this pathway. And the last one here is the tubero-infundibular pathway. Now, when activity decreases here, that's going to lead to an increase in prolactin. This results in a decrease in libido, sexual function, galactorrhea, and gynecomastia. All right, next question is multiple choice. So, of course, hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's talk about the cerebellum. This, of course, is going to help us control and coordinate movement and balance. Now, typically, when you're in the clinical setting, you can quickly and efficiently test the cerebellum with things like the finger-to-nose test, gait assessment, heel-to-shin, dysdiatocokinesia. Remember that unconscious proprioceptive information is acquired via the inferior cerebellar peduncle from the spinal cord. Now, lesions of the cerebellum are very important for us to know, so let's look at those. A lesion to the lateral aspect of the cerebellum will lead to a negative effect of the voluntary movement of the extremities. One of the important mental notes to take with cerebellar injuries is that those with lateral lesions will tend to fall towards the side of the injury. So you've got a right-sided lesion, watch for falling on that, on that side. Left-sided, watch for falling on that side. Medial lesions of the cerebellum, which will encompass things like the vermis, flocculonodular lobe, and fastigial nuclei, tend to lead to bilateral motor deficits affecting the axial and proximal limbs, truncal ataxia, which is characterized by a wide-based gait. They can also cause nystagmus and head tilting. Let's also here discuss the basal ganglia because this is an important structure for its role in voluntary movement and postural adjustments. Now, the way it works is it receives cortical input, then provides negative feedback to the cortex that modulates movement. Don't forget your anatomy here. The striatum is composed of the motor portion of the putamen and caudate, while the lentiform is made of the putamen and globus pallidus. Now, we've got both a direct and an indirect pathway that we need to understand here with our basal ganglia. First, the direct pathway is our excitatory pathway. This is mediated by the D1 receptor, while our indirect pathway, which is our inhibitory pathway, is mediated by the D2 receptor. So when dopamine binds the D1 pathway, it stimulates the excitatory pathway. But when it binds D2, it inhibits the inhibitory pathway. All right, let's end that lecture here. I'll see you guys on the next lecture. Thank you.